And joining me today um, is Ms. Karen Amert and Mr. Devin Johns. And we're gonna certainly kind of fill you in on the world of our, that we live in this uh, comprehensive ecosystem world, but I certainly wanna kind of prep up and talk to you a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today. So we realized that a critical element to educational success today is having an architecture that allows for learning to occur both online, in-person, and really some combination thereof. And additionally, it's, it's difficult to always have a complete digital infrastructure to ensure learner success for both organizations and certainly for the students, right? So we consider this the educator, the student, and the organization as a whole. So in this session today, we're going to talk about the comprehensive ecosystem, the lessons that we've learned in this direct pivot to digital, um, and sharing kind of some of these best practices that are really in place to kind of drive success for your students and your learners. Um, as always, this is a uh, moderated session, uh, so we are going to be using polling software. Uh, there are going to be polling questions located throughout this presentation, and so if you'd like to participate, we encourage you to do so. Please uh, download the Poll Everywhere app. Um, once you download the app and put it on your mobile device, you can uh, just text, uh, you can just uh, use Clo Healthcare as the username. You have the option of also joining us via text messaging by texting Clo Healthcare to 22333. Uh, and then also, if you went onto the Poll Everywhere uh, website, you can do www.polleverywhere.com forward slash CLO Healthcare, and you'll be able to participate as well there. Uh, you can ask questions throughout this presentation. Please do so in the chat, uh, and then we'll be uh, pulling those questions together at the end to answer, uh, to answer each of those and certainly have conversations around it. So, um, as Olivia mentioned, my name is Amar Patel. I serve as the Chief Learning Officer at CAE Healthcare. Um, I've been involved in, a, in innovation and simulation for well over 20 years now. Uh, my background certainly comes from both the fire and EMS organizations, working in academic side of the house as an educator, um, working as adjunct faculty uh, for a school of medicine, and then certainly working closely in the hospital and healthcare system before moving over to industry. I've had the opportunity of both doing simulation and innovations work, as well as practicing as a paramedic. Uh, both on air and ground critical care transports, um, and then certainly working on the disaster medicine side of the world. Um, for the Society for Simulation, I'm actively involved in a number of different committees, um, and certainly corporate end tables, one of, the, one of the ones that we uh, actively uh, engage with. With that said, I'll pass it over to Karen. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Karen Aberts. I am currently the group leader uh, here at CAE for digital learning, which is encompassing um, you know, learning management systems as well as online content and virtual content. Um, I've been working in this kind of, in this area of industry for at least the past 10 years. Um, received my MA in global media and educational technologies a couple of years back. Um, learning how to work with uh, the internet and social media and all of that, trying to figure out how that creates a digital environment where we can uh, encompass learning and share that more with others. Excellent, thank you, Karen. And Devin? Okay, hey guys, Devin Johns. Um, I have um, I've been working in this healthcare simulation industry for my entire career. You can see I, I have a background in biomedical engineering. And I've filled, you know, various leadership roles, from technical um, to marketing, um, throughout that time, um, and and mostly have focused on patient simulator mannequins. But I now have my hands in all kinds of digital solutions um, that provide alternatives and augment those those physical experiences that were more traditional. Excellent. Thank you, Devin. Uh, we're super excited to certainly talk about our digital landscapes and some of these lessons learned, but we want to certainly start off, as I've always done in these presentations, um, straight out the gate with that million dollar poll question, right? And so take your devices out, certainly scan the QR code, you'll be able to download the, uh, the app directly onto your phone if you haven't already done so, uh, or join us via text messaging or on the website uh, using the Clo Healthcare um, uh, username. So let's start off with that first, uh, the first question, and we're always curious uh, of the individuals that certainly join uh, these sessions, where are you from, right? And so you should be able to see this on your device and put a pin on where you're located. I'm really curious of where learners are coming from, from all over the world. And we've, uh, in the past sessions, we've seen uh, all different time zones across the way, even though it's in the afternoon for us, right? So we've got some folks overseas, certainly uh, coming up on there. So 
we're we're spread out. I think the three of us are certainly located here in Sarasota, but as an organization, uh, we've been on meetings all day with folks uh, certainly in Hungary and in Germany and other places. So it's always curious to certainly also talk about the weather. I think some folks have uh, with first snow right in the north uh, not in the northeast, but uh, in the northern part of the U.S. And we heard our Canadian colleagues talk about the snowing elements there as well. So. So those jumping in, thanks so much for sharing. So a little bit in the, in the Midwest and uh, certainly some in the North and then overseas. So great to see. So now that we've got you a little bit engaged in there, we're kind of curious, right? So tell us uh, about your primary discipline. Are you a program administrator? Are you an educator? Um, are you a sim op or a sim tech? Um, are, you know, is your primary role more of that clinical professional, right? So are you an EMS provider, a nurse, an RT, an allied health professional? Um, so are you a physician? So, you know, we're kind of curious of where our audience certainly is engaged with. And we certainly have had some students in here. So I'm kind of curious if you're that student element also. So it's a pretty interesting divide. So we've got the educator, the program administrator, and the sim text running the state. So thanks so much for being here. Excited to have you. Um, so we're going to really start this presentation off um, talking about the impact on digital education um, and really on where, uh, you know, where this journey has taken us. And we're going to use two elements of before COVID and after COVID. I'm going to hand this off to Karen. All right. Make sure that I am unmuted. Good. Uh, so welcome again. Um, as many of you are aware that, uh, you know, the, the encouragement to mo go digital has been happening long before COVID, but definitely the push has become much larger now that more people are working remotely, uh, which also means learning remotely and communicating remotely. Um, before COVID, as we jokingly have now decided it is BC, um, you know, oftentimes you had many more in-person in meetings and conferences, um, going to wonderful places like Vegas or even Orlando. Um, most of, for us, I know a lot of our education, especially around product training and things like that was, and, and definitely simulations was done in person in classrooms, either going on site or having people come to us. Um, uh, there was always, there was the, always the option of using, um, blended where we did use some hybrid online um, but a good portion of it was very heavy for in-person training um, you know moving to digital was was a slow process for us in the beginning um, we had a roadmap it was a beautiful roadmap going through lovely tree-lined passages and then COVID happened happened and everything kind of crashed and we suddenly realized oh my goodness um, while our roadmap was beautiful we now have to figure out how to do it faster, effectively, and, and fluidly, um, which became a really large challenge for, for many of us. And we found that many of our colleagues were also in that same boat with, you know, they had all talked about it. They had plans of moving it. They had, you know, maybe more content that was ready to be online, but, you know, not necessarily always the system to be able to provide it. And that's where we started looking not only at our digital systems and the ecosystem in general, but our content and what that was. Um, so as we move forward. So in now, uh, our process of moving forward uh, since we have gone with, uh, since moving into the COVID world is um, one of the biggest things that uh, is hard in my role to explain to people that uh, taking in-person training uh, and moving it to a digital format, whether it be self-paced or even virtual, uh, the same amount of hours that you spend in a classroom are not the same amount of hours that you spend online. Taking an eight hour class that you would have done interactively with other people does not uh, equal doing eight hours sitting behind a computer. Um, I'm sure that many of you have attended certain things that have said that, yes, you're going to be here for four hours. We're going to give you breaks. It's just not the same. Everybody loses focus. Um, you do not get the same opportunities to network that you do in uh, in-person training. So we had to find ways to be creative with taking curriculum that was normally spread out over a whole day and trying to figure out how to chunk it into smaller uh, bite-sized 
opportunities and, and those sort of things. Um, and finding ways to keep people engaged while you are sitting online, even if it is virtual with in kind of in this situation where you have a facilitator who is actually interacting with you at the exact same pace. But how do I know that you all are actually paying attention and not doing emails on the side or other items uh, that happen to occur when you are attending webinars. So it's definitely a disconnect for the facilitator, a disconnect for the students. And it's very hard to find those, those ways of keeping people occupied. That is one reason why, yes, we add things like video. We add items such as polling questions. You add items that if it is a self-paced course that make uh, your learner interact with the content itself so that they have a reason to read and, and be present at all times. Some of the challenges is figuring out how to measure competency while you are distance. It's much harder to have uh, to check people off, say, uh, who might be doing CPR classes. How do you find a way to get them up to a point that they could do it self-paced, but then they still need to be physically in front of somebody to actually perform CPR? So competencies are something that we are definitely still working on and finding ways of appropriate assessments, um, both uh, being in testing or being checkoff points and items like that. Um, we are uh, fast use learning that uh, things such as adaptive learning is something that's very uh, important. Training, online training that, the, uh, that works with the learner as they are going through to have check-ins so it can balance where the learner is in their knowledge. Um, oftentimes what we have found is that a learner who believes that they are an expert in a topic as they go through a certain course and are asked questions aren't as expert as they believe to be. So we have to make sure that we can measure that, that we can make sure that we are keeping them focused on their education as they move forward. Um, let's see. There's also the challenges of security, network restrictions. Um, if you work in hospital situations, you understand that your IT probably closes down many, many things. So that sometimes just searching the internet, sometimes you cannot find education that you were looking for. So we had to make sure that we can reach people, a wide variety of audiences, um, and make sure that we are being secure in our offerings and in our systems that we're using so that you can rely on being able to tell your IT department that you know we are a safe bet. So that leads us kind of into some other questions, talking about attention spans. Um, as you know, the, the more we get into the digital world, we believe that more people have uh, shorter attention spans. Um, that being said, let's see, we do have our next polling question here. So if you are ready, I will take you to the next question where here we have, what do you believe the attention span of an adult learner who is actually in the classroom might be? So as uh, certainly as folks are answering this question, I think, you know, it's equally important to highlight, um, Karen, some of the changes that were happening even before COVID though, right? There was so many elements of digital that was in place. Like if we think about healthcare systems, EHR systems were moving to SaaS models. Data was a core element of the work, right? People really were important about data. You know, Blue Cross and Blue Shield invested a significant amount of money in building a healthcare repository for a data AI. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly elements of where, um, uh, you and I grew up in the, on the hospital side, so joint commission, you know, all the, uh, all the online training for the mandatories that we were already doing in place, mm -hmm. and there was some elements of in-person that still kind of we were dabbling back and forth with in the before COVID times, um, you know, and, and as well as, you know, certainly looking at, at where the breaking points were, right? What, what was too much for online and what was too little? And this, before COVID, we were kind of like, ah, everything goes to, this is like the global world, right? You're 100% online, you're 100% in person, you're 100 kind of somewhere in the middle of blended learning. Some learners did really well in either, but it was very teacher centered, right? And it was very, we gave it to you, we expect you to know it, and we moved on, right? And that was, that was kind of the end result. And certainly you're seeing some of that. And the intent of simulation, even certainly today, was for us to really create that 
that application applicability point. And I think some of our landscapes and the organizations really think about what does the user get out of it? What does the learner actually get out of it? What does the educator actually get out of it? And in the after COVID times, you know, so much has changed. I mean, how many of us will certainly love to sit in a computer for eight hours a day? I mean, I'm sure many of you guys do that today and your, your, your derriere hurts a little bit or your back hurts or the chair isn't right or you got to stand up and you'll see us, you know, constantly shifting <laughs> to be able to, to be comfortable as we're, you know, as we're going through this. And uh, a lot of lessons learned in this after COVID world and certainly uh, ones that I think many of us are, 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 are there. You know, I'm certainly curious, and I know this question doesn't ask it, and we'll get to that in a second, but I'm certainly curious of the folks that are here, you know, where is that, um, where is that breaking point where you as an educator realize that the curriculum I'm teaching in the classroom, I need to pivot to a virtual setting, and how the heck do I do that, right? And I mean, you're, you've taught, Devin has taught before, I mean, certainly, you know, how do we take an adult attention span, which is where I'm going, right? And turn it into a digital attention span and yet keep the same level of impact within a curriculum or content. Right, because absolutely you cannot get exact, it's not apples to apples when you move from an in-person classroom setting to an online. You're never going to get the exact same level of experience. And as uh, you notice, let's see, people think it's 60 seconds and others think it's 10 minutes. Um, the average attention span is typically about 10 minutes before you know you start losing your audience. And that kind of probably happens even in a non-learning situation. Mm -hmm. Many of us are, are kind of that way. Um, uh, so the next question though is even more interesting is, oh, it's not advancing. Give me one second. Yep, yeah. there it goes. There we go. So what do you think the attention span of an adult learner in an online environment might be? This one, when I found this study yesterday, I found this very fascinating. Somebody wrote in the chat. Minus, minus five. five. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yes. <laughs> Well, but there's lots of distractions. I mean, think about it. I'm sitting in front of a computer right now. Teams is going off, chat's going off. We're seeing chats come across. You know, I've got folks writing C also, 15 minutes in C. Your phone is buzzing constantly. You're getting text messages. Your focus isn't in right, the it's, same place. It's very easy to get distracted. And many of us are now working even from home versus even in an office environment where it might be more conducive to being able to focus easier on uh, education while you're working. Um, so it seems that the most people think that uh, uh, 60 seconds is it. Based on a study that Microsoft did in 2015, it is eight seconds. So your audience will lose focus if something does not happen on the screen to catch their attention every eight seconds. Wait, what was the question again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I lost you after eight seconds, right? Karen, I think you really touched on it. I think interactivity is a big part of it. You know, when you're standing at the front of a room, you're talking to a bunch of people. We don't appreciate it, you know, um, consciously necessarily, but all just the eye contact and everything that you're getting is part of what's what's fostering that engagement. So, I mean, you know, one thing that I like to do when I can get away with it is um, make people be on camera. Um, you talked about mm -hmm. surveys like we're doing now, and that, that's another great tool, but anything you can do to kind of uh, ramp up that, that interaction. Absolutely. But the great, um, but one of the challenges with doing online learning or uh, e-learning in general is you need to have some, it has to have purpose. You can't just suddenly have the screen change just every eight seconds because People are also going to get eye fatigue. People will also find it just annoying. So, you know, that's that's the challenge of how do you every eight seconds make sure that you are being relevant with whatever it is that you're offering and putting for engagement. Um, let's see if I can move forward. Amar, you might have to move the slide forward because it doesn't oh, like there, so. there we go. So this is kind of why we talk about why are we doing this? Why are we going digital? Um, for your end user, what they're finding for the most part is there's a lot more flexibility for to be a learner. 
they can do find courses on demand so that they can take it at their own time and their own pace, which means that they have less time away from work sometimes. Um, you know, not that we always want to tell people go home and do your mandatory education, but people are finding it a little easier to fit it in in between activities, um, maybe do a little on lunch. And if you're working from home, you can be in your pajamas and comfortably doing your own, you know, your own training, working at your own pace, online courses definitely allow for that. So um, many courses, of course, you can, you know, if it's a longer course or very heavy content, you can break it up for yourself so that you can come back and review the information. Um, it does focus much more on the student than it does the teacher because if it's self-paced, there's often no facilitator involved at all. So it's solely education for the student and understanding how the adult learner um, is hopefully learning. There are opportunities definitely for using virtual and augmented reality. So the adaptive opportunities that I kind of uh, referred to earlier of finding ways of, of branching your education down paths, um, making it so that based on the question and response, the training takes them down a specific path so that they can learn more about topics where they need to brush up and they can gloss over topics that they already know very well. So finding ways to be able to do that and such as customizing content. I know a lot of people talk about scenarios. Being able to use scenario-based education is extremely important. It makes it relevant, it makes it timely. Um, and most of all, learning can and should be fun. Um, I know that when you're doing compliance training, it's not always fun, but there are ways that you can make it interactive. You can make it very game oriented for your learners, um, you know, such as hidden objects sort of things. Uh, Nate, you know, identify the five safety issues in this image, um, those sort of things. So finding anything that you can do to, to take out the pain point of, oh, here I am sitting in training again. Um, is very important. For the organization, the benefits, um, and these are just some of them, it's a cost saving. If you were doing a lot of heavy in-person training, of course, your travel is going to uh, go down. Um, the number of facilitators that you might need for an educational piece um, might be you know, a little less. You actually can offer more training opportunities uh, you know, across multiple time zones. Um, which means that you're reaching a larger audience. Um, like, you know, today we have people who are across the globe attending this conversation today that wouldn't normally get to do that if it was only in person. You know, I guarantee their company is not going to fly them across the globe for a one hour presentation. Um, uh, you do have to learn, though, how to be learner focused versus business focused. Well, yes, you have to move your business forward through your education and your training, but you also have to make sure that it's focused towards your learner. They're the reason you're offering this training. Um, online training, uh, depending on the level of interactivity, it can be faster to spin up than developing an in-person classroom based training. Um, you can off, offer just-in-time training programs. So um, as many of you have probably seen, organizations pushing out all sorts of education on COVID and how to handle it and how to work remotely all of a sudden. I mean, Zoom, immediately, I'm sure their stock went up um, with, with that. Be, and they started pushing out how to host Zoom meetings, how to be effective managing your teams. So just-in-time training programs. You can also reuse your content uh, if it's in a digital format, you can adapt it very easily to reuse it over and over again um, and that sort of stuff. And the great thing is, is you get to collect all of this data. Um, data is the key to finding out what's working, what's not working. What are your students liking? What are they not liking? Um, what courses are the most popular so that you know you should offer them more or you need to expand that program? Those are the things that really find um, some great data points that really help uh, things out in that regards. Um, which just kind of leads us into talking about the impact on, whoops, that went too fast, go backwards. Um, you know, impact on users. Um, they have more topics to choose from. It's easier because, you know, you're working from home, you have the ability to start looking at topics that not only work towards your actual professional development, 
but could also be more of a personal development that influences your professional development. You can find more leadership classes. You have the ability of multiple topics, um, things like that. You want to learn a new language. Uh, those opportunities are easier now online than having to go sit in a night school class to learn new languages. The time management, it's much easier to say this course is going to take 20 minutes. Great. I can take 20 minutes of my day, do this online course. Then I can go back to my other tasks that I'm doing uh, work-wise. Location is no longer an issue. You can train from anywhere and pretty much from any device. You don't have to be attached to a desktop. You can use your phone. You can use tablets. Um, all of these options make it so much easier now than it used to be. And the great thing is, is you have the opportunities to connect with a wider group of colleagues. Um, through using the chat processes and webinars and things like that, you can chat with somebody who is across the globe and learn new best practices. What's happening in a different country? What are they doing? How can you bring that into your organization? Um, you know, your organization, as I mentioned, they're going to start reaching larger audiences, which is wonderful because we get to start learning best practices from other organizations as well. Um, you know, we're building better partnerships with companies, with our customers, because we're having to have much more specific and oriented conversations. Um, we're not just always, you know, hi, how are you doing and things like that. We have to make sure that we're being clear and concise in our communication. Um, whether it's facilitating conversations like this or it's, you know, just an online self-paced content. So we're finding new ways of collaborating. Um, it used to be that you could stop somebody in the hallway and just kind of say, oh, I need to ask you about this question. But now you're having to find ways to connect, whether you're texting, whether you're emailing, whether you are using video chat, any of these options, you're finding new ways of collaborating, you're using new tools, you're finding how Google Docs actually work maybe for the first time or how something like Smartsheet can help manage all of your project tracking um, and keep everybody on the same page without having to have handwritten notes everywhere. So it's it's really a great thing. But as you look at this picture of this lovely little image, you know, the outcomes of this can be good and bad. We're now asking kids to sit in front of a computer screen for hours at a time. You know, we all know that there are pros and cons to staring at a screen all day long. As an adult, it's a challenge. I can't imagine as a small child how I'm supposed to feel remotely engaged um, while learning at the age of eight or something like that. And I know that a lot of parents are now having to be much more involved with their kids and, and than they used to, which of course also disturbs your workday, I am sure, um, and things like that. And we already know that it's like the, uh, American Pediatric Society is our, our um, association has even said that there, there used to be screen time limits. Well, we're totally violating all of those at this point in our careers um, by putting kids in front of a computer all day long. Um, well, it begs to ask the question though, is that screen time limitation still exists on adults too, right? I mean, there's, there's some level of healthiness that still exists on that side too, right? So variety is key in success, right? We shouldn't live it. Um, you know, it's a, uh, there was an old adage that used to say, uh, stop watching TV, TV will rot your brains, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly there's some questions around, you know, length of time in front of monitors and stuff for your eyes and, and your own sanity, so. Yeah, I mean, studies do show that there is eye fatigue the longer that you stare at, you know, a computer. And many of us, as we're now working from home, are probably not using the most ergonomic setup. You're either sitting too close to the screen, your chair is not too good. So all of that also affects how you're learning, you know. So if you are doing online education of any sort, you know, if you're not physically comfortable, that also affects it too. Yeah, sure. So, um, whoops, just clicked on the wrong screen. There we go. So, um, you know, as we talked about, why should you care about this? Because it's not going away. No matter what happens with COVID, um, distance learning or, di you know, digital education is pretty much here to stay. It is definitely something that has been progressing for more than a decade. But because of this pandemic has definitely pushed it to the forefront that, you know, companies are learning that, oh, we can save money if all of our employees work remotely as opposed to being physically in an office. So, you know, these opportunities are going to continue. Um, you know, as 
uh, the millennials and the generation even behind that are coming more and more into the forefront. This is how they operate. Most of them are so comfortable with digital formats that they are they are assuming that that is the next wave of being able to learn um, and that they can do it at any time to meet their needs on any topic that they want to. So we as organizations and company need to start embracing it. We need to start showing that there is the opportunity to not only just save money, but to make greater contacts, to even potentially make money off of offering these kinds of, of, of training environments. Um, you know, we will always have the reason to need in-person training because there are just some things you cannot learn by just watching a video. Um, YouTube is fabulous for many things. Yes, I can change uh, my windshield wipers by watching a YouTube video, but I do not expect to learn how to do brain surgery by doing it. So there will always be hands-on, the need for hands-on simulation, hands-on experiences. Um, but the key drivers of this is being flexible is the agility to be able to train anywhere at any time. It makes your content very learner focused, um, making sure that you are being very concise with your learning objectives, making them clear so that you can teach to those and make sure by the end of it, hopefully they have grasped those contents, um, that content. It's making your content very rich. It's finding new ways of uh, refreshing your content. If you have been offering the same class over and over again, you're now looking at it in a completely fresh way of how is it going to be exciting to your audience. It helps you become fiscally responsible and hopefully brings you, you know, being able to push out stuff in a faster pace as you need to, meeting the demands of your organization. Anything else anybody would like to add? No, I, I think it's great. This journey has just begun, right? I mean, I think it's just starting in this pathway. Uh, who knows where where um, pandemic is going to take us? Certainly, you know who knows what the time frame looks like, but I think we've gotten a taste for what is possible in this ecosystem as a whole, right? And the flexibilities of work from home and the flexibilities of working remotely and still having engaging and meaningful impacts. And I think to your point, um, as long as learning can still be impactful and learning can still be fun, I think it's still going to continue down this way in the long term. And you know, we're certainly we certainly believe in that. And Devin's going to talk a little bit about about that. Uh, um, and so I think that's, that's, you know, a great, a great uh, point to end on there. So, um, so Devin's going to share with you, you know, certainly uh, some of these, um, uh, some of these next pieces. Uh, I'm going to give Devin, this is all you. Okay. All right. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to show you guys um, a handful of slides here and try to give you a little bit of um, taste of the technology and what we're doing at CAE. Um, I'm happy to say that we've been, you know, kind of thinking about building a digital ecosystem and, and starting to put together the, you know, the building blocks um, for years now. And so um, we didn't, we were not caught completely un, unprepared um, for the big digital pivot that we've seen over the past year. And I'll show you some of those examples. First thing we'll do is we'll start with a, another poll question. So you say I have control, there it comes. Yep. All right. So just, uh, I guess, folks ramp up. There it is, right here it is right there. Okay, so the question is, do you feel your organization is able to easily adopt new and unique connected systems? Here we're really alluding to the kind of IT difficulties um, that, that Karen touched on. And some of you may already, you know, have tried to bring in to your simulation centers or to your work at home practice um, various tools and gotten some pushback um, from the powers that be in information technology. I know that some institutions, um, you know, have an easier time than others. Some are really locked down tight and very inflexible in their policies and others are a little more open minded. A few folks in the chat uh, selecting A as well there, Devin. Yeah, a few A's, but I think um, not surprised at all that um, overwhelmingly here, uh, there's some concern about this. And, and we're definitely concerned, you know, as a company trying to offer these products and services about how we, we overcome this, this obstacle. And I'll come back to that question here in a moment. Okay. All right. So... 
um, you know, what is a digital ecosystem? Um, simply put, you know, these are interconnected software um, and things. <laughs> I say things, right? Because, um, you know, more and more we have these devices in our lives that we, we don't really think about as being software products, but they in fact have software under the hood and they're more and more connected devices that integrate with other things um, that we use. So, you know, the obvious simple example that we all have experience with is a suite of office software. You can do all kinds of great things, you know, um, uh, linking and embedding objects, you can copy and paste and retain formatting, et cetera, et cetera. And so we all have this experience. And in this case, um, you know, companies that provide these, um, such as Microsoft that we're all familiar with, um, they, they achieve this by building a lot of core technologies internally, proprietary core technologies that they reuse. And it allows them to sort of um, make these connections between different systems. And, you know, I, I mean, I uh, hope you all agree that, um, you know, this trend that we've seen in, in software suites like this is really a big time saver, you know, eliminates a lot of frustration, a lot of manual work that we used to have to do years ago. Uh, another example, smart home, right? And here, here we're really mostly talking about devices, but also, but also pure software applications. And, you know, you guys know that these things can all work together. Um, you know, you can have these apps that, that talk to all these different devices and devices can share information with each other um, in ways that are valuable to you. If you think about it, you know, it's all really just one big digital ecosystem in the world, kind of like, kind of like, you know, in nature, everything's part of a bigger ecosystem. It's hard to find a truly isolated system. You know, this smart home may send me an email um, and suddenly, you know, you, you see it's, it's um, becomes, becomes very expansive. There's not always automation that ties together these ecosystems. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to export a file and load it over here, but it's still a digital ecosystem. There's still a connection between the things, uh, but more and more we do see automation. <clears throat> so, um, you know, Karen did a great job of uh, summarizing a lot of the value of um, ecosystems. I'll, I'll kind of have a little bit more of a technical focus. Um, so, um, Efficiency is the thing that comes to mind often, right? There's a lot of automation. Um, this eliminates pain points in our day-to-day -day lives and ultimately saves us time, right? So it's, you know, from an operational perspective, it's lowering costs to deliver, um, you know, in this case, like the training program um, that we're talking about. Accessibility, of course, in the COVID world, um, we all know how important that is. Um, but not just accessibility from no matter where you're sitting, but accessibility to your, uh, you know, of your data and of controlling your systems from different interfaces. I can log into my Google Home and I can control my thermostat. I don't have to go to the thermostat app, for example. Interoperability, really important. So I talked about that a little bit. Um, we have, you know, a wide range of, of training tools in our portfolio. They increasingly talk to each other, but also ancillary systems such as capture and debrief systems, um, uh, just as important. Data is a big thing, right? It's not just that our, our products today uh, collect more data than they used to and, and show it to us and in, in, um, you know, digest it in useful ways for us. But now with all these things connected together, we can correlate data. Um, you know, my, that thermostat, for example, you know, can know when I'm home and when I'm not um, based on data it's getting from other sources. Security, and sometimes we, you know, and we'll, I'll talk more about this. We touched on it earlier. S security is a risk in these systems, in a sense, but it's also a strength in a lot of ways. Single sign-on um, reduces the chance of infiltration. You know, automatically backed up cloud storage reduces the chance of data loss and so forth. Maybe not obvious, but systems that are part of an ecosystem tend to be higher quality. And that's because, you know, as developers, we're leveraging 
stable, mature frameworks that already exist, right? That are proven um, and very generalized. And so that allows us to, to create quality products and in fact, develop products more quickly to make their, you know, cost of acquiring them by the consumers um, that much lower. We're not always starting from scratch when we're developing products in an ecosystem. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about technical challenges. This was the big one that we already talked about, um, connectivity. Um, so, you know, all of us in our personal lives, we're more and more connected and it's super easy and all our phones, you know, obviously are, you know, all our apps are, are connected to the internet and, and using that. Uh, but in institutional settings, it's been, uh, it, institutions have been slow to adopt these things um, because of course, they have bigger concerns when it comes to security and privacy. They have laws they need to conform to, they have uh, sensitive data. We all have our personal data, our banking data and so forth. Um, but you know, um, in institutions, we're concerned about test security also, um, potentially medical data in the system that needs to be protected uh, according to laws. And so these things, you know, th this is where we're focused because these are clearly, you know, the, the things that are limiting adoption. So back to that survey, um, we want to provide um, satisfactory coverage of all these issues so that we can satisfy those IT departments with, with you know, rightfully very high standards because um, they've got a lot of risk they're trying to manage. And the last thing under challenge is system integration. So this is really from the development perspective. Um, so um, maybe you're uh, collaborating with or, um, or directly developing different applications. One of the things we think about um, from that perspective is developing standards for integration. Right? How do systems talk to each other? And how do we make that really clear so that people can go off and design different pieces of the ecosystem and we know that they're gonna mate up properly, right, and work. And one of the ways that we do this is through APIs. And um, CAE not only consumes a lot of APIs that lets us leverage, um, you know, uh, existing technologies, but we also develop APIs so that system integrators can take the stuff we've built and tie it to their systems. Obviously the goal from the user perspective is it has to just work. Right, you, you, you expect these things, um, if, 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 you know, if you're told that they work together, you, you, you expect them to, um, uh, to work easily. Okay, and one more slide before a couple more questions. I've probably already lost your attention according to the data we saw earlier. Um, maybe I'll get up and dance or something, but <laughs> what I wanna show you about and hopefully, um, uh, this is inspiring for you is some of the things that CAE has done already in this area. Um, we haven't talked digital ecosystem, but we've been building a digital ecosystem. Um, we, we leverage those kind of mature frameworks that I've talked about, you see some here. Um, that really gives us a leg up, helps us with quality and time to market and lets us deliver more capabilities. We focus on selecting modular technology. So our user interfaces are built with web technologies, um, very modular and easy to um, deploy in different ways. We have, um, if you're familiar with our, our new digital learning platform, Maestro Evolve, you know that it features a bunch of virtual medical equipment, patient monitor, defibrillator, ventilator, anesthesia machine, um, really cool stuff. Well, that same stuff you can use physically, right? And in, in what we call simulated equipment. Um, so it's about commonality, right? Commonality, not just from a development standpoint, but commonality from a user experience standpoint. Right? You wanna take your learners and be able to flexibly use different modalities of training and have a certain commonality among those experiences. You wanna have a continuum of training where you perhaps prepare people with a digital experience, move them into a physical experience that's gonna leverage and, and, and adapt to their performance virtually, and then perhaps follow up with more virtual stuff, right? So that 
that commonality across the digital and physical um, uh, training tools that we're offering, um, we believe has a lot of value. Uh, similarly, content can be moved between our virtual and physical um, kinds of simulations um, and between different software tools. In this case, you might uh, author content in the IRIS tool and export it for use on CAE Maestro, uh, the software that controls our mannequins, as well as the software that controls our new virtual environment. Lots of stuff in mixed reality we've been doing for a few years now. Um, you, you, you'll be well aware of this um, if you've been going to um, IMSH, for example. Um, so we have lots of AR applications, but they're not just AR applications, they're applications that talk to our mannequins, synchronize with them and work, you know, work together with them um, to uh, add, add training value. Of course, we have a center management solution called Learning Space that um, uh, since you know, the beginning has been able to talk to our patient simulator mannequins as well as those from other manufacturers and get data from them, in some cases even control those systems. And um, uh, we increasingly integrate with learning management systems. We have our own learning management system, um, which is the, the starting point for a self-directed um, experience that we use to train people on our new Air One real ventilator. Um, and our learning space system can in fact integrate and has been um, for some time been able to integrate with your own learning management system. Finally, thinking about data, we're, we're building a really robust data backend and infrastructure where we can leverage um, technology from the aviation side of our business called CAE RISE and um, be compliant with data privacy um, rules. So I'll jump into another poll question here about data, right? So one of our aspirations for data is that we can help you guys provide evidence of the return on investment of your training programs. So my, my question for you is, is anybody listening? If you can come to the table with data that shows that your investment in training is having a real world impact, um, can you increase your budgets? Interesting question, right? I mean, I think, so uh, just to make sure level playing field, there's two elements and you'll hear me talk about all the time, right? Return on investment and return on uh, expectations. And this notion of ROE through the Kirkpatrick's Car hierarchy of modeling of levels one through four, some argue there's level five, you know, but ROI is such a pivotal thing in terms of cash back for the organization and showing value. Um, you know, I, it seems like uh, certainly the bulk of that sits at, 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 at the highest. Um, the highest percentage there, right? And and it's, I, you know, for me, I, one of the biggest curiosities isn't the yes, it's certainly the no, right? It's where where is it ROI not the challenge? Is it you have a fixed budget? You know, for me, it's the no's that really are are, are curious. I'm expecting the yeses. I don't know if, if you, Devin, have any thoughts behind that either. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's, um, you know, I'm happy to see a lot of yeses. And if we look at what's in the chat, I'd say we've got roughly maybe five out of six um, yeses. Yep. Um, <clears throat> but um, um, I like to believe that um, um, eventually everybody will be listening to these arguments, right? Yep. yep. I think um, in academia, it's probably a harder argument to make. Um, whereas when you have a chance to translate the impact of your training out into real world healthcare practice, you've got a um, you know, much more compelling argument. So next uh, questions popped up, uh, please write your preference with pre-developed content um, versus uh, pre-made, uh, sorry, pre-made content versus user created content, right? So uh, do you prefer your own? Do you prefer buying? Do you prefer something in the middle? Uh, you know, certainly we're generally curious about that because you hear a lot of notion and I'm sure Devin and I've talked about this exclusively run on the fly versus creating content versus um, doing nothing with it right and objective based learning versus subjective based learning essentially is the pathway. Yeah, yeah. Some of our clients come to us and they say, you know, we create everything ourselves from scratch. 
we have very particular expectations and we want it just so. And some people say, you know, we don't have time and uh, we like your content and we want as much pre-made content as we can get our hands on. Yeah, a couple in the chat are C's, uh, C's and D's too. We have a lot of C's in the chat too. So really interesting. I think most people fall somewhere in between, which is kind of what we're seeing here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this is where, at least for us, we started leveraging, you know, and finding better partnerships of, you know, understanding that somebody is a subject matter expert and has the capability of building something much more enriching than, you know, we, we could do internally sometimes. Just looking at the clock, uh, just uh, a little bit, so. Yeah, okay, I'm just gonna spend a few seconds on the very last slide here. If we could move, you'll have to move me past it tomorrow. Yep. Absolutely, give me one second here. Stuck on the survey there. So let's, uh, ooh, let's let me keep going here, let's do that. Perhaps. Okay, yep. so, so here you see, you know, the CAE digital ecosystem, these are all, um, I mean, first of all, obviously we have a lot of different kinds of users. You see them on the left there and we're focused on the needs of each one of them. And what we wanna create is a seamless experience where the traditional simulation center um, operations that you, you know, see depicted here at the bottom, um, the in-house learning management systems that everybody has, right? Can tie into the CAE digital ecosystem. And you see different kinds of capabilities here um, that we offer. Um, and, um, you know, our goal is increasingly to make these things all work harmoniously, right? Um, to increase the automation and the, the ability to extract actionable insights from the data um, that's available from these systems. Yeah, the connectivity is huge, right? I, you know, I think as we think about this, and we're going to show the use case here in a second, but the connectivity between these elements is such a pivotal piece to make sure that all levels of users are able to really see their journey throughout the entire learning experience. And I think that's what centers certainly strive for and try to try to replicate themselves in the process. And that's where the data really starts becoming important so that you can build those profiles better and see what what they're doing and how they compare. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Devin? No, thank you. Thank you, everybody, Excellent. for your attention. Uh, so, you know, we certainly want to give you the quick deep dive. And as we're, I know we're gearing towards the last uh, six minutes, but feel free to jump in and throw some questions in the chat if you've got anything specific you're, you're um, edging to ask. But, you know, what the million dollar question here is what does the ecosystem bring forward? Single system of connectivity driving a complete learning cycle. Devin mentioned that in detail of where that huge value is. Your ability to be able to mix, uh, to mix segmentations. And I'm a big believer in online. Uh, online education and training, a bit of uh, mixed reality in the middle of that chaos, and then certainly adding an in-person element really connects the dots and solves uh, pathways forward. And that's that journey that Devin described to you is what we're really pushing fast and furious forward with. Um, this cross-pollination um, effort, the educator content's available, and we often forget about the educator, right? So we can't forget about the educator because the educator themselves needs development as well. And it's important for us to ensure that content meets educator needs as well as learner needs. Um, and then, you know, some of these drivers, connectivity, transparency, and agility are certainly pivotal in this journey forward for both the educator and the learner. So, you know, if you look at the research as a whole, we'll, I'll spend a few seconds talking about 2017 study focused on hybrid simulation and training and an effectiveness of a training tool uh, for, uh, for uh, intrauterine conception devices, so IUD devices, and they found that both hybrid simulations is more effective from a subjective standpoint in student learning, and people actually objectively rated higher in their test scores when they did pre and post testing. And so it tells you a little bit about why multimodal and multi-centered learning is such an important thing in driving this effective forward. When we think about 2018, same concept, focused on nursing-based learning atmospheres, and the idea is still the same. The results support integrations of hybrid simulation experiences in the nursing curriculum. Again, 
multimodal, multi-centered effective learning. It drives that subjectivity and objectivity of learning forward. So we go from true formative to summative assessments in some of these in some of these things. If we think about 2020, and this is residency training, this is COVID-19 pandemic, you know, really looking at the conclusions associated with it and using innovative simulation technologies brings the addresses the educational gaps. It may not be the sole solution, right? Online is not the sole, and this points it out. Just like mixed is not the sole and simulation is not the sole. You've really got to have a connective model in place to drive that forward. And I've shared this next paper with, with many of you, and this is you know, New England Journal of Medicine uh, documentation that was published and it really focuses on how adaptive education can drive effectiveness. And you can see pass rates change between 89 and 95%. And so again, important to have a complete structured approach in that, in that notion. Uh, just an example, Devin showed you some of these uh, theoretical ecosystem design. You know, we look at it as if you take basic and advanced ventilation, which are published today in the LMS, uh, you take those courses, you add a little bit of Maestro Evolve, which is an online training tool, and you do that as a virtual instructor-led um, training element. You debrief within Learning Space because it's a connected solution that's present. And then you turn around and do an in-person simulation experience. And in this case, we'll say with Aries. So two-hour experience in practical concepts of mechanical ventilation, right? Now you have a full curriculum of full content. You're addressing every one of those learners needs across the way you're creating that mixed training portfolio and mixed environment. And if you think about our own digital ecosystem in the mix, you're addressing the vastness of learners. You're leveraging the technology that's present there. You're certainly adding into debriefing. And then you're certainly uh, continuing to push forward mannequin based or simulation based in person training that's pivotal in that journey forward. And so there's so much there to really consider um, that that we really need to make sure that we're addressing all the learners needs that are present. So I know I went through that quickly, but I, I certainly wanted to share with you those deep dives. Um, there's a question in the chat. I think context needs to be structured to the students you are training per group dynamics. And that is, I, I would, I wholeheartedly agree with that, right? I think the context does need to be structured into the, into the, into the user, right? Into the learner at the end of the day, whether it's the educator, or whether it's the student. I mean, I don't know if either of you have any, any other thoughts on that. No, I mean, I would agree as well that, you know, you are looking at that and you're looking at your group dynamics to make sure that the context is appropriate, um, as well as just, you know, relevant to what they're doing and what they actually need for their skill base. Yeah, and it, you have to change, it, you have to be, you can't be very static in nature. You have to be very dynamic in nature to ensure. And, but, you know, the goal here in, the, in addressing the ecosystem was to create a dynamic environment for learners wh wherever you are in the spectrum and whatever your journey takes you. So whether you're the administrator, the educator, the op, the learner, you're, you're learning about it or you're providing training in either direction, right? We wanted that, that dynamic environment to be present. And I mean, I don't know if you have any other closing thoughts with that, Devin. Yeah, I mean, a simple example would be, you know, if, if your learners are mostly focused on cognitive skills, if your training needs are focused on the cognitive skills, it, it pushes you more towards the digital approach and psychomotor skills and teamwork may push you more towards a physical approach. Yeah. Right, great point. So uh, with that said, uh, um, my thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you for Karen and Devin, certainly for, for jumping on and, and talking about, uh, about all the amazing stuff that we're doing as an organization. Uh, and thank you to, uh, to the Society for Simulation Healthcare allowing us to, be, to share this information with you. So have a wonderful rest of the week and stay safe, folks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Amara. Thanks, Karen, and thanks, Devin. Thank you.